Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Daytron webinar number two. This one is all about the uh, vacuum work holding. So we're going to cover a variety of vacuum work holding methods. Uh, we're going to take about 45 to 60 minutes. We'll be doing both the presentation that you're seeing now, as well as some live demonstrations that we're going to do a little bit later. Um, question and answers we'll absolutely do, but we're going to save that for the end of the presentation. And last but not least, be sure to keep an eye out in your email for a special offer and some follow-up links and further resources uh, for everybody in attendance today. Um, but before we really get into it, let's uh, take a moment to introduce ourselves. Dan. My name is Dan. Uh, I'm an application project manager here at Daytron. That means I work closely with our sales and marketing department for cool projects like this. I am a manual transmission kind of guy. As the only way to be. Right. I think Unless so. you have an automatic Unless transmission. Yeah, right. Uh, and then uh, I'm a Grimsbo Norseman owner, number 866, which, you have right, which I have right here, which you can see if you're watching this video. Uh, and then uh, I'm on Instagram. Follow me at IGSDan. Right, where he posts plenty of good Daytron milling stuff, absolutely. Uh, as for me, that's me, Neil DeMajor. Uh, I was a Daytron account manager here from 2011 to 2018. Uh, what you see there is true. I do think cilantro is gross. I'm one of the 50% of the population that is genetically predisposed to hating cilantro. Disposed. So, dis, dis, what, what was I trying to say there? Disposed. There we go. Predisposed. Thank you. Predisposed. Um, I know Back to the Future inside and out, yes, and you can find me on Instagram at HSC Pro. <coughs> so a little bit about Daytron here, just to give you some history about where we're coming from. Um, Daytron Germany was founded in 1969 as actually an electronics and software design and manufacturing company. Uh, they built their first gantry CNC milling machine in the late 80s. Uh, it was a homegrown internal use machine that they used for PCB depaneling. Um, but I think they kind of quickly realized it's a whole lot more fun to make and use milling equipment than it is to make just electronic components. It's very boring. Yeah. <laughs> so so they, made, they made the switch. Um, to go along with those and to complement them, um, they ended up producing, designing and producing a variety of both pneumatic clamping systems as well as vacuum clamping systems, some of which you'll see a little bit later on in the presentation here. But, uh, you know, awarded top 100 uh, most innovative small to medium-sized company in Germany in 2004, 2007, 2011, and they continue to innovate uh, when it comes to machine tools, particularly with the Next Control uh, machines like the Daytron Neo, things like that. Uh, for Daytron Dynamics, so Daytron Dynamics started up in Canada in 1996. A few years later, moved uh, down into New Hampshire area. Uh, in North America, we've developed two styles of vacuum tables, the Vacuum 8 and Vacuum 8 HD. Uh, we've expanded several times over the years, and we currently support over 400 Daytron machine customers in the U.S. out of our main uh, office here in New Hampshire, as well as an office out on the West Coast. Nice. So let's see. Presentation goals, what are we here to do? Well, obviously there's, there's a huge spectrum of work holding uh, methods, types of hardware, ways of getting the job done, but for today we really want to focus on vacuum work holding uh, in all of its different forms. Um, there's a lot that can be done with this, and I think a lot of folks um, sort of kind of uh, uh, have a, an idea in their head that it's really only for light duty work holding, but right. there's a lot of ways to do it that allow you to, to do some much more robust milling on it. And we're going to dig into that a little bit today. Yeah. We want to talk about pros and cons for each variety of vacuum work holding that's out there. We're going to touch on every single one of them uh, and talk about where it makes sense to use the, the more affordable solutions and where it makes sense to use a more sophisticated high end solution. And then last but far from least, we, we really want to provide some valuable strategies that you can use if you're using a Daytron machine and a Daytron vacuum chuck or, you know, a, a Mazak machine and, and a vacuum chuck that you made yourself. Uh, we want to give you guys some tools that you can use to be more successful with whatever uh, systems you're going to be using here. So Dan's going to dig into that and has a lot of really good tips and tricks later on. So hang out with us and we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, but before we do that, we want to sort of talk about the concept of vacuum work holding, how it works, why it works, and how it's evolved over the years. So, um, Dan, give us an idea. What's, what's the principle of operation behind vacuum work holding? Right. So the key thing to note is that with vacuum work holding, it is not about the suction. Uh, kind of a common misconception. What it is all about is atmospheric pressure. Uh, so you're relying on the 14.7 pounds per square inch of atmospheric pressure at sea level 
uh, to hold your part down. So if you can pull a perfect vacuum under your part, that's how much force is being applied on top of it. We're relying on the difference between the pressure above and the pressure below the part. Right. So you reduce or you try to eliminate the pressure on the, the underside of the object, and as a result, you have all of that atmospheric pressure holding the part down, which as you'll see in a moment with some examples, can be a significant amount of pressure. Right. The, the maximum holding force is limited. It's based on the local atmospheric pressure. So if you're in Colorado, up way up high right. in the mountains, it's going to be quite a bit different than if you're down here in, say, New Hampshire, where we're pretty close to sea level. Yeah. Uh, it also is based on the size of your part. It's not equal for everything because you need to take uh, the surface area of the part and multiply it by uh, the local atmospheric pressure uh, to get how much clamping force you're going to have. And, and more precisely, it's the amount of surface area that, that is, is you're able to pull a vacuum underneath, right? So if you have a part that has an XY area of, you know, 14 <laughs> inches by 14 inches, but it only has a few small areas of flat surface area that you can actually pull a vacuum on, well, you're only going to get holding power based on those few small surface areas, right? right. So it's important to keep that in mind when you're designing or, or considering using vacuum work holding for a given part. Yep. Um, so let's put some numbers on this and get an idea of how much effective holding pressure you can really get on a part the size of... Right, so let's start with a sheet of paper. Everybody knows how big that is, 8.5 by 11. So we multiply that. We get 93.5 square inches of available surface area. You multiply that by uh, your local atmospheric pressure, 14.7 psi, we'll say. That's... And you, you've basically got a grizzly bear standing on your part. Exactly. Which, I mean, if you consider that, I mean... That's a good bit of force. That's a good bit of force, and it's something that you could mill as aggressively as you want to, and I, you know, <laughs> you'd be hard-pressed to get that thing loose with all that weight holding it down. Right. Now, if you bring down that XY area to something a little bit smaller... The uh, post guard. Right, so you've got 3.5 by 5, which is only 17.5 square inches of area. You multiply that out, you still get, you know, an overweight <laughs> panda bear worth of, worth of weight on there, about 257 pounds. Yep. Again, still a, a very large amount of force holding that down. Well, if we go even smaller than that, say a quarter, so if you have roughly 0.72 square inches of surface area on that, multiply that times atmospheric pressure, we still have about 10 pounds of force. Or as I like to think of it, that's, that's two five-pound gummy bears. Right. I, I try to think about force in, in relation to bears. Yeah. Because, you I know, measure things in Durangos. That's unrelated. That's a story for another day. Beats, bears. You can you know. find me at IMCS. We'll talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> so evolution-wise, where did this all come from? How has it progressed over the years? And, and where is it advanced to now? Well, the, the simplest thing that you can think of when it comes to vacuum work holding is the suction cup, right? This is a technology that's been refined. You might find it, you know, holding your GoPro, holding your GPS in your car, holding your cell phone, but it's also been uh, adapted for industrial purposes, right? And if you look at hardware like this, which, you know, we'll provide a link in the follow-up email that will give you um, uh, some resources to pick up this type of hardware. These are suction cups that have material that is very specific. It's very resilient. It can go through many cycles without fatiguing. It has some support uh, hardware in the middle here, brass fittings. It's up to the, the everyday use that you might see in an industrial situation. And really, you've seen some, some Datron customers using suction Yeah, we right? have a customer that actually uh, uses a Datron to cut out sections on a dishwasher panel for all the buttons and LEDs and things like that. Right. And they use suction cups on, on their pieces, so they, they take that injection molded piece, slap it on, sucks it right down to a hard fixture behind it, and they can quickly route everything they need. It's quick and easy, uh, and it's just the right amount of force for considering they're only routing plastic panels. Right, right. So pros on this type of technology, uh, it's inexpensive comparatively. Um, you know, I mean, I'm sure these, these industrial vacuum cups are, are not going to be the same price as something like this, but still, compared to a lot of other work holding solutions, it's pretty inexpensive. Um, another good aspect of it, and you'll see this for a number of the vacuum solutions that we have here, it's a low vacuum draw, right? You're not pulling a large flow of air. You just It's important that you pull a, a hard vacuum, right? So you can use a basic venturi pump, which operates on shop air, uses the venturi principle to develop a vacuum, um, and that works just fine. You can use them in multiples. In the example that Dan gave there, they had several of these cups strategically placed around the part, and that was enough to, to hold it. Yep. Some of the drawbacks is low clamping strength rigidity, uh, holding pressure is limited by the suction cup size, so we, yeah. as we talked about atmospheric pressure before. That's right, so if that's a one-inch cup, you're only going to get 14.7 pounds on yeah. that. 
And then repeatability may not be favorable. It sort of depends on how the fixture is designed, but it's something to keep in consideration. Yeah. I think the big thing to keep in mind with all of these um, is, you know, you have to right size the work holding solution to the part, right? So in that case, it was thin plastic. The cutting forces are not going to be large. You're not being very aggressive with the milling. Right. Suction cups are going to be the right fit there. Yep. But if you need something more robust, next comes the vacuum nest. And I think this is something that a lot of folks have seen um, or, or maybe even fabricated and developed themselves. It's a pretty straightforward design. You have a, a shallow pocket that is sort of cut out the same size or very slightly larger than the, the footprint of your part. You have a gasket going all around the perimeter, as you see here. And as you see here, these are all gaskets to accommodate the final uh, uh, perimeter of the parts that are going to be cut out of this. From there, you have a vacuum line coming off. And that's, that's the basic hardware that you need to create a vacuum nest. So what's great about these is that they're, it's a simple, inexpensive concept. You know, if you've got some, pa some spare material hanging around the shop, um, you know, chances are you can develop a vacuum nest to hold a part using only that. Um, you can use it for single parts, as you see here. You can use it for multiple different parts, as you see here. Um, you can use it for highly complex 3D contoured parts, as you see here. It all comes to the design of how you design that nest. And just like the suction cup before, these are a low vacuum draw type of solution. So Venturi pump will work fine on this as well. Right. Some of the cons, uh, susceptible to work holding failure from as little as one chip. So what we're getting at there is if you don't maintain your fixture, keep it clean. If you go and swap parts out at a high rate and forget to, to sweep off some chips before you put it down, you're very likely going to have an immediate failure. Um, so resulting fixtures as well must be inventoried in case of repeat jobs. So Remember, it takes up real estate in your shop, so if you're yeah. going to be running this thing every couple of months, then it's going to live somewhere for that period of time. And you need to keep track of it. You need to make sure it doesn't get lost or, or nicked or dinged. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, small shops, small businesses might not be a big deal, but if you have a lot of repeat jobs coming through your shop, you know, you end up, you know, up to your elbows and fixtures, and it just becomes a pain in the neck. So. Sometimes, you know, there are other things I that can be more attractive. The other con that we didn't list here was that they're extremely specific to the task. Right. So, uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's just worth noting, especially as we move on to our next one, it's in the same vein of, uh, of the, the vacuum uh, the nest, nest. Um, except now you're able to adapt a gasket into a grid pattern. So this is probably the most common vacuum chuck that you see on the market. Yeah, when you say vacuum chuck, I think the, the grid gasket style chuck is what a lot of folks think of immediately, right? Right. Um, it can be relatively small. As you see here, you can have very large format grid gasket vacuum chucks. Um, and these are a great solution. They work very well for the right types of parts. Um, if you've ever used one, you know it takes a little bit of time as you set up for the job, as this guy is doing here, yep. to place the gasket. Um, and you have to place the gasket, you know, very carefully. Um, but th these can be a good solution. Some of the pros of these, they're a flexible design, as Dan mentioned earlier. The vacuum nest, you, you design it, you fabricate it, you put your gasket in, and you have a fixture that's very good for just one part. Um, whereas with the grid gasket chuck, it's adaptable. Right. You, you put the gasket in there and it can accommodate anything that can fit within the XY constraints of the chuck um, or fit within the lower limit of the dimensions of the grid, right? So flexible design remains on the table. You don't have to inventory it, stuff like that. Keep, keep track of where it's at. Um, again, it's a low vacuum draw type of system. So Venturi pump for something small like this will probably work fine for a large format chuck like this. You know, you might need something with a little bit more CFM flow, um, but still relatively low vacuum draw. And, and with proper gasket placement, you can, you can cut parts free from a single sheet on this. Right. But tell us a, a bit about what proper yeah. gasket placement is all about there. So that's one of the cons, is uh, the gasket material, first of all, has to be cleaned and repositioned from job to job. So you have to maintain it. Uh, if, you, if it starts to break down and you, you start to have air leaking by, uh, then you start to run into issues. The other part is cutting through a part can be problematic at best. So that's where these really fail. Uh, and this is sort of true with, with the, either of the last two we were looking at is that you're cutting into your, your suction source, uh, then you're going to be in big trouble. You're going to lose uh, suction there where you're cutting in, and it's going to cause uh, pressure to equalize on both sides of the part, which means 
going to lift and you fly off part, from all right. forces. Right. So it's something to, to bear in mind is that if you're going to cut the part out, even if you are outside of that gasket, um, that you don't want to be too far outside of that gasket because then you're, you're cutting an unsupported piece of material. Right. So, so as an example here, if we look at this, this is a rectangular shaped piece about the size of a cell phone. But if, you, you know, if your final part extends out beyond this a little bit and you need to do some milling on those parts that are unsupported, you have to be very, very careful because it would be easy on that unsupported area to develop a lifting force that could potentially pull the part off. And one thing that we should differentiate here is, you know, cutting parts free on the perimeter is one thing. Um, that's a little bit more doable on this vacuum chuck uh, style, but cutting through a part would be kind of cutting a feature that goes through the part in the middle of the part. Right. Um, and that is a situation where, you know, if you had a through cut feature here and you didn't have gasket around it, um, you would lose the part, absolutely. Yep. You know, so it's something to keep in mind there. Um, moving on from there, the next sort of uh, um, step moving on from the grid gasket vacuum chuck is what we call the universal vacuum chuck. And this is what we use uh, quite a bit at Daytron because they're, they're highly conducive to this type of machining center. Um, but the difference that you see here uh, in this example, this is what Daytron Germany calls their meandering groove or serpentine groove vacuum chuck. It has a central vacuum port um, that uses this serpentine groove to kind of disperse that vacuum force around a four inch square area roughly. Um, that works well for parts down to a certain size, but if you need something even smaller still, um, this is the Vacuumate series that we talked about a little bit earlier that Daytron Dynamics has developed and produced here in the US. The two different flavors here, this is your Vacuumate standard, has about nine holes per square inch whereas the vacuum eight high density has 24 holes per square inch. Yep. So this does a, a better job of, of localizing that vacuum pull, and it gives you that much more ability to hold very small parts on these chucks. And I know, Dan, you've, hold, you've held parts uh, quite small on some yeah. of these vacuum chucks. Uh, the one that comes to mind was uh, about a 60, uh, sorry, 60, 61 aluminum. I believe it was about 20 to 30 thousandths of an inch thick. Uh, and I was able to cut a whole sheet, 12 by 18 sheet, of uh, quarter-inch round discs wow. uh, and retain them all on vacuum, no problem. This wasn't even using adhesive paper or anything like that. Yeah. So uh, with the right strategies, they can accomplish a lot. Now, if you contrast that, take that same quarter-inch diameter part, if you were to try to hold that on a vacuum nest, right. you might have a hard time finding gasket thin enough that you could make a gasketed area uh, and still hold the part. You know, even if you were to use an O-ring or something like that to go underneath each one, it would mean designing that entire fixture, maintaining that entire fixture, right. make sure no chips get on any of those O-rings. Oh my gosh. It becomes kind of a nightmare. Yeah. And similar thing with a grid style chuck. I mean, you'd have to have, I mean, with quarter inch diameter parts, your grid is probably larger than that quarter inch. You, you wouldn't have a prayer. So a lot of folks would resort to double-sided sticky tape to hold those quarter inch diameter parts. Right whereas a technology like this allows you to be just much more efficient. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the main pros of it, is it can accommodate a very wide variety of part sizes, all the way up to your maximum XY of a chuck, which can be anywhere from 12 by 18, 24 to 36, yep. 60 by 40 on some <laughs> of the large format machines. So you can hold very large down to very small parts, all without changing the work holding setup, which is fantastic. Um, What's unique about this chuck as well is that it allows you to cut through the part without losing holding power. And that is something that is dramatically different from the grid gasket style chucks we were talking about before. And Dan's gonna demonstrate that in, in a few minutes here. But the flexibility that these chucks allow, leaving the chuck on there, not making any alterations to it, and being able to go from, from a, a part that is 10 inch square down to one inch square, just like that, um, really makes a shop more efficient. I think that's what a lot of users really enjoy about this style chuck. Absolutely. But there are some downsides, of course. This is a more costly setup than a basic vacuum chuck system. The reason being, um, for example, either of these designs either have 0.4 or 0.3 millimeter holes in the center of each of those little cups, uh, and you have between one to 5,000 in each plate. Wow. Um, so that means it's gonna take a lot more time to manufacture these. So while they uh, work much better, it comes at a price. Yeah. Um, it requires a much higher vacuum draw 
as well. Because we're introducing so many places to lose vacuum here, it means that you need high CFM to back it up. Initially, as you put a part down, you might not need a tremendous amount, but as you start to cut parts out, you need to have enough flow to overcome the amount of loss that you introduce from cutting parts right. out. And I've had a lot of folks ask, well, why can't I just take a large CFM pump and hook it up to my grid gasket style chuck? I mean, that should work, right? What's unique about the design of this chuck is that it allows you to cut through while self-restricting the amount of vacuum loss. And that's one of the most unique things about it that allows it to do what it does. So, yeah, you could put a high CFM pump on a grid gasket chuck, you wouldn't see the same type of performance. Right. You know, it'd be, it's, it's, this chuck is highly specialized and designed for small, small parts holding with high CFM. Yep. Um, and the last thing that, that is um, uh, sort of a con or a drawback <laughs> on these types of chucks for some folks is that it cannot be used with a flood coolant system machine, right? At least so, not easily. All right, so if you have a typical VMC that has a flood coolant system, which most folks do, um, you can't just slap a universal chuck on there and just start cutting. The coolant will be ingested into the chuck as soon as you cut through some of these features here. As you see, we've cut through, and um, you know that's just going to lead to ingesting that coolant in. So yep. in those cases, we advise folks use a cold air blast, use it uh, an MQL system from a company like Unist, um, and turn off your flood coolant. And that allows you to take all the advantages of the vacuum chuck um, without the, the drawback of ingesting that flood coolant. Sure. Um, on this slide here, we want to talk about one thing that's a little unique to the universal vacuum chuck, and that is the sacrificial layer. Right. So this is sort of the key to understanding why we use this and how it works. Um, so you have your, your breakdown here, vacuum chuck on the bottom. This is what disperses your air up to your replaceable top. We say that's replaceable because you can exchange it, but you really don't want to cut into this. Right. That's what the sacrificial layer is for, is it gives you a layer to cut into uh, when you're cutting out your sheet material. Uh, as well as it helps disperse the vacuum more evenly. Um, and the reason behind that is that we're using card suck typically, mm -hmm. uh, 20 to 30 thousandths of an inch thick, uh, and it's, it's paper, right? So it's got fibers, uh, and it allows air to flow through it. While you could blow air through it with a hair dryer or an air gun or anything like that, right. the amount of vacuum that we're pulling behind it, it's pulling right through, and it creates sort of a localized vacuum zone underneath, just in the fibers of the paper. Um, the applicable materials we use are high-density fiber board. We mm -hmm. like to call it magic board in-house. Uh, permeable cardstock, that's the vacuum card you see there. Yep. Uh, and then also cardstock uh, with adhesive grid. So uh, we have two products, Vacuum Card Plus Plus and Plus Plus Plus. There you go. Uh, both are slightly adhesive uh, and allow for very small parts holding. Yeah, and those can be a lifesaver when you need to know a lot of very small parts or parts that, you know, don't have much XY area to hold on to. Yep. Um, the last material that we've used occasionally, um, and it could be just, just what the doctor ordered in some cases, um, is porous aluminum. And that's, that's the type of material that you can find in a variety of sources. It's a little pricey, so you don't want to use it unless you have to, but when you need it, it can be a great, great solution. Yep. Um, one thing that we can note is the sacrificial layer, depending on the type of parts that you're cutting, um, you can actually <coughs> reuse it um, from, from uh, production run to production run. So let's say you have, you know, a 12 by 18 sheet that you're cutting a dozen parts off of, and you're just going to, you know, cut several of those in a row. Uh, you don't necessarily have to replace the sacrificial layer um, from run to run. If the parts are all in the same spot, it's all the same parts. Um, as long as you don't cut too deep into that sacrificial layer, right. you should be able to reuse it, right? As you cut deeper, you sort of pick up a little bit of a paper burr, and that's what you want to avoid because then it can cause the part to sit a little bit off the surface, allowing mm -hmm. some air to leak in, as well as the cuts that are there. If you're working with a smaller piece versus a larger piece, then you're going to have more loss because of the cuts that are in the paper. So right. very small parts, I'd stick with a fresh piece of paper. Larger parts... Uh, we'll say over, you know, two square inch, something like that, is probably fine to use, reuse some paper. And then last but not least, um, especially in the case of the magic board, this is sort of, this is true for the porous aluminum too, but we do it most often with the, the high density fiber board. Um, this sacrificial layer allows you to, to hold parts that would otherwise require dedicated fixturing. So what we mean by that is, you know, imagine you have a four inch square part that has, you know, you know, three or four standoffs on it. You know, they're they're a hundred thou tall, and they and they're standoff bosses. That if it weren't for those four standoffs, you'd be able to vacuum chuck this part, right? Yep. 
Well, take that part, take your high density fiber board and just mill out some pockets to accommodate those four standoffs and then you can hold your part on the vacuum chuck. So you can still take advantage of the, the vacuum chuck holding ability um, even though your part might have, might not be perfectly flat or it might not, you know, it might have some standoff features on it. And that's what's great about magic board or that high density fiber board. So we're going to move into section two here. This is where we're going to get into some demonstrations. We have a Datron ML Cube LS here, uh, which is a 60 by 40 XY travel. The LS denotes linear scales on it. So this machine will hold uh, deadly accuracy across its whole work envelope. It's got a 40,000 RPM HSK E25 spindle. And Dan's got a couple different vacuum chucks loaded up here. So at this point, you should switch to the live video uh, feed for the presentation so you can see all the cool stuff that Dan's about to do here. Um, and uh, let's get going on it. Yeah, so, so just to give you a glimpse of what we've got on the machine today, we have one of our standard uh, regular hole, that's what we call it, vacuum mates. Vacuum mates. And as well, over here, in traverse, there's some paper. We have one of our meandering groove or S groove uh, vacuum tables. So you can see every little black grommet there, that is in the center of a 100 millimeter square zone. So you're able to isolate vacuum into those individual sections. So if you only needed one section to work on, you could isolate vacuum everywhere else and concentrate it uh, so you have the least loss. Because that's one of the most important things is to reduce loss wherever you can. Yeah. And actually, that's, that's one of our first tips, right, is always plug or block off any unused chuck area prior to milling. And there's a couple different ways that you can do that, really. You can, um, you know, using that serpentine, the meandering groove chuck, it has those on-off valves in the middle of each section. Um, you can simply turn those off. Sometimes your chuck doesn't have that built in, and so you need to find other ways. And that can be as simple as, you know, putting a piece of scrap material down on the unused area of the chuck to block it off. I've seen some folks use masking tape or, um, you know, gosh, saran wrap or anything you might have around that will simply block the flow of air and allow you to focus the vacuum onto the specific area of the chuck that you need to use. All right, so now we're going to load up our vacuum chuck. So we're going to start off by making sure that your vacuum table is completely clear of debris from the last job, in which case this is a little bit dirty. Wet that off. We'll throw down some of our Datron vacuum cards. So as you can see, this one was actually used previously. You can see a little bit of the cutout and a little bit of that paper burr that we were talking about before. So I always try to use the freshest looking piece of paper I've got when I'm starting a fresh job. Okay, you place that down. And then we'll place down our eighth inch thick piece of 6061 aluminum. Turn on our vacuum source. In this case, we're using a through table vacuum port on our ML cube. And then we're going to locate our workpiece. So while Dan is doing that, I just want to note real quick that uh, in addition to, of course, selling the vacuum chucks themselves, Datron stocks and sells the vacuum cards as well as the magic board uh, vacuum cards, both with and without adhesive grid. So if you have a vacuum chuck or an application that you think would benefit from these type of vacuum cards, you know, absolutely hit us up afterwards and uh, we can hook you up with uh, some of the vacuum cards so you can take, uh, make use of them, you know. But with a quick probing cycle there, the machine's located the part and we should be ready to start demonstrating uh, one of our first milling examples here, which I believe is going to be save the perimeter cut for the final operation, right? So why do we... So that's kind of a, a given. I almost forgot to put it in this presentation, but uh, we're so used to using vacuum chucks that it's worth noting. Some, some beginners don't realize uh, that it's important, especially for smaller pieces, to do all the interior cuts first. So if you're cutting out, in this case, we're doing a sort of front panel sort of demonstration, uh, cutting out some, some uh, bolt hole pattern or... Uh, D holes or a D sub connector sort of pattern. Yep. You want to do all that work first and then cut out the inner feature, uh, the outer feature, sorry, perimeter. In this case, you can see we have pieces popping out there. 
we're not taking any effort to keep those right now. This is a strategy that we see commonly uh, used for corn pan manufacturing, things like that, where we're just looking to get all the material out quickly as possible, and that means having a, a little drop that flies off. Yeah, which, you know, it's, it's a great example because, you know, with the right strategy, you would be able to hold those parts. Yep. And that's one of the biggest things that um, a lot of folks don't expect is, is how important strategy becomes as the part gets smaller. Right. The smaller and smaller the part gets, the more and more you need to rely on your strategy to be able to hold that part effectively. Otherwise, they'll pop off like you see right there, even on a, on a good vacuum chuck, you yep. know? So Dan's doing all of the internal cuts first, and then here, I believe, we're gonna move right onto the perimeter cut as soon as we're done cutting the mounting holes here. So as we said, benefits of saving the perimeter cut for the final operation, it maintains maximum holding throughout the majority of the milling process. Um, another subtle thing about this you want to keep in mind is that the utility, the usefulness of this method increases as the part size decreases. So the smaller and smaller your part gets, the more and more important it becomes to save the perimeter cut for the very last operation. Again, keeping as much vacuum uh, holding power on the part as you can throughout the majority of the milling process. All right, once this wraps up, we're gonna do a tool change. We have to do a little bit of pocketing first to make this next demonstration work. So just enjoy the show. Okay. <laughs> Just something to note, as you can see there, these are all Datron single fluid end mills, solid carbide. Um, these likewise were de devised by Datron, highly spe specific to high speed milling in aluminum and other materials. So if you want to try out some of these tools, you can hit up tools at datron.com and they'll get you set up as well. We also have a, uh, if you haven't seen it, a single flute end mill webinar. Uh, that was webinar number one. Yeah. You can find that on YouTube. So the next tip that we're going to go through here is leave the drop, all right? And we've heard these called, you know, drops or slugs or whatever you want to call them. It's the material that's left over in the middle of a window uh, or a circle opening. You want to leave that drop in there. And, and why is that, Dan? So retaining vacuum is the key thing to using one of these universal style vacuum chucks. Um, so we always want to try to leave material behind if we can. In this case, we're taking most of it away because we just want to leave a very thin, maybe 20,000 thick piece of material at the bottom so that we can leave it there. The taller it is, the more effect the tool has on it. So if you to leave a, a fully sized slug in it, it may move just based on the fact that as the tool is spinning through there and it applies force on the material, it's got more leverage. Yeah. So it could shift. Now, as the part gets larger, they may not matter nearly as much based on the amount of clamping force, but we're taking some precautions here. Yeah. So we're cutting three of a, a, almost the same part here. Um, you'll see some of these, we're gonna cut the drops out entirely. Some of them we're gonna leave in there. Uh, we're gonna use these for a couple different demonstrations here. One of the other subtle things about leaving the drop in there is it actually, of course, reduces the milling time. You're not spending time milling that internal area away, um, so it'll save you that time on your cycle time. And then also, you'll, you'll get more parts per tool uh, when the drop is left in there. You won't have to use up your tool life milling away that material that, you know, doesn't have to be taken away uh, at the end of the day at all. So as we get towards the end of cutting this fourth part here, um, I think one of the first holding strategies you're gonna show is the tabbing method, right? Yep. So this is something that I've used in Mastercam in this instance, uh, as well as I know that Fusion 360 has it. Uh, the ability that on a 2D contour you can leave behind tabs of materials to hold the part to its original piece of material. Um, and the purpose behind that for most users is so that they can take the part off and then cut it with a razor blade or snip it, something along those lines. Uh, in this case, we actually want to cut it right off. Um, 
we have enough RPM, we have very good vacuum work holding, that it's okay if we just go off, uh, go with the same tool and cut it right off at that point. All right, so really the purpose of the tab is to just keep everything in the same place throughout the milling process, and then the final step that will be done uh, will simply be to, to cut that tab off, uh, you know, yep. and it's very quick. It, it imparts very minimal cutting force on the part, um, <laughs> and it works extremely well. I think it's probably, when it comes to holding multiple parts on a universal vacuum truck, it's probably the go-to method for most users, right? Well, uh, maybe. It's not my go-to method, if I'm honest. I listed it because it is, like, the most common thing that comes up. My preference is actually going to be uh, one of the other ones that we have coming up. But it's what you hear most commonly as being one of the main methods for achieving this. So you can see here as it's going around that the Z-axis lifts up a little a bit every time to accommodate a tab. There's a tab, yep. Yep, there it is. So In this case, we have four tabs. There we go. Then we come back in at a slower feed rate to mill the rest of the way. same time, you can take a little bit of a finish pass from the wall. Now, my preference is actually the next method, the onion skin method. This is what I use most often, which is to remove most of the material in Z down to about five thousandths of an inch remaining. Uh, and the reason I do that is because it's easier than tabbing. All I have to do is say my final Z pass is ten thousandths of an inch, and then I'm cutting five thousandths of an inch into the paper. Uh, so that way I can do it all in one pass, and essentially I'm, I still have a tab, it just gets smaller as I go around. Right. See this one used quite a bit as well. Um, very good strategy, easy to implement in CAM, um, and it works extremely well. So, yep, skin removed is the final milling operation. Um, the next strategy that we want to tell folks about is called the ramp tab method. This is kind of using ramping to sort of develop its own tab, right? Right. So as you ramp into the material, in this case we're taking 40 thousandths per revolution around the part. Once you get down to a certain point, once we get down to a certain point, you'll actually have, you'll start cutting into the paper and leave material behind. So right here we have a little bit of material left behind, and you can see there now it's completely broken free. I like that method, I just want to point out, I like that method more than the previous method because it's applying gradually less force to the part yeah. until it reaches zero. With the other method, it's constant. The next method is coming in with a smaller tool. So the key to this is when you have a very small part to cut out, or I should say very little surface area. And this, this example, we're actually going to remove all three pockets versus retaining these two. Uh, we're going to cut all of them out. So with this, we're going to come in with a smaller tool, one and a half millimeter single fluid end mill at a higher RPM at a slower feed rate to just barely take out what's remaining. So this will allow you to cut all those pockets free and remove just the frame of that triangle part. And one thing that we want to mention that we kind of uh, skipped over real quick there is, is tab placement. When it comes to placement of the tabs, what's your strategy behind where to put those so that you import the part minimal torque on the part as you're cutting it? So two things is to try to put your tab, or the final tab at least, on the longest side of the part. Uh, that's going to have the most clamping force in that area. Uh, as well, um, try to place it as close to the center of the part as possible. That way it will impart less of a torque to it um, as it cuts. Okay. Nice. So we can open up the door here, give folks an idea of what these parts look like. Here, I'm going to move the machine over. and get a good look at it. Sure.
turn off our vacuum. Came out looking pretty good. And this one is completely removed entirely. Came out pretty nice. Came out great. We're able to cut completely past the edge, so there's really no secondary operation for deburring or anything like that. We have to do or tab removal. Beautiful. So we're getting close to the end of our allotted time here, so I just want to mention real quick, everybody check your email inbox for that 15% off Datron vacuum truck systems coupon code. We're also going to provide links to examples of Datron customers using vacuum trucks, um, white papers on vacuum work holding tips and strategies written by Dan here, uh, as well as some other links to companies that you can get, you know, vacuum nest materials, uh, suction cups, vacuum pumps, other work holding solutions. Uh, to help you be successful there. So, for those that got to um, for those that got to conclude with us, we thank you very much for hanging out with us. Uh, and at this point, we're going to move on to the Q and A section of the uh, of the webinar. So let's start taking those now. <laughs>